guys, what's up? I hope your week is going well. So, <laughs> what, a week ago or so, I posted a video talking all about the kind of controversy around parabens, and that video and many of my other videos had uh, elicited quite a bit of enthusiasm in the comments for a video talking about sulfates and the whole sulfate-free shampoo and avoiding sulfates, and if I could go into that. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today are sulfates, specifically SLS, something that is frequently demonized out there by the cosmetic industry. So what are sulfates? Well, sulfates are a group of something called surfactants. And a surfactant is an ingredient that is added to a product, whether it be a shampoo, a conditioner, a cleanser, it can also be added to, to other household items to decrease the surface tension between things like dirt molecules, oil molecules, and water um, to allow for, for removal of those things. It can also kind of help to function as anti-static agents as well. Surfactants such as SLS and sul sulfates have um, kind of a structure that is such where it's got a part of the part of the structure is water loving or hydrophilic, and another part of the structure is lipophilic or oil loving. And therefore the water loving part kind of gloms onto water and the lipophilic oil loving part gloms onto dirt, sebum, oil, and traps the dirt, sebum, and oil in, in something called a micelle within water and allows for for efficient removal of those particles with water. Um, and therefore, it's frequently in a lot of rinse off products and, and personal care things. It just makes cleansing efficient, easy and gentle and, and efficacious. Surfactants are classified based on the charge of their water loving group. So it can be a positive charge, um, which is referred to as a cationic surfactant, a negative charge, an anionic surfactant, it can have multiple charges within it, and that's referred to as an amphoteric surfactant. That's something like cocomidal propyl betaine. These are really common as anti-static um, surfactants. Or it can have a non-ionic non um, uh, lipophilic group as well. And each different type of surfactant out there, whether it be a sulfate or some other one, has different offers different things for hair conditioning, for cleansing, and therefore in personal care products, shampoos, surfactants are incorporated in different ratios to impart different qualities to the product. So different shampoos that target um, different hair types, different hair cleansing needs, um, really have a different ratio of surfactants. Most shampoos, for example, the base surfactant is going to be an anionic or a negatively charged uh, surfactant and sulfates are some of the most common common surfactants that you will find in in shampoos. They have received a lot of attention as of late in the media. Sulfates, especially SLS for whatever reason, have recently developed this really really negative reputation in uh, cosme in the ca cosmetic industry, and reports from various unscientific sources make a lot of false claims about SLS and sulfates, claiming it to be uh, carcinogenic, causing cataracts, ocular toxicity. These are, th this is misinformation. And I don't understand where this information comes from. I suspect that a lot of the claims arise from misinterpretation of scientific studies that are readily available to the lay public. Um, and, but that these groups are, are not qualified to interpret the results of the study or understand the meaning. Maybe they don't have access to the full article. You know, a lot of times if you, if you go on PubMed and you're not from, you're not, you know, affiliated with a particular library, you may only be able to pull up the abstract and you can't actually read the article. So I don't know where they're getting their information from. Yeah, but as far as the controversy around cataracts, it's really not substantiated whatsoever, and I believe arises from simply misinterpretation of the studies. There was a study that showed that following either chemical or physical inter, um, irritation of, of corneas, 
that if you expose the corneas to really, really high concentrations of SLS, sodium lauryl sulfate, that the high, when you expose them to high concentrations of SLS, it slowed, it slowed recovery, it slowed repair of the prior chemical or physical irritation to the cornea. So what this means is that if you have suffered an abrasion to your cornea, whether it be from getting something in your eye or you know irritation, something got in your eye, if you then proceed to pour highly concentrated SLS into your eye, do be aware that it's going to slow recovery. All right. So you can see how that does not, it does not recapitulate how the public uses SLS containing products in, in any realistic manner. At least I hope it doesn't. Another study tested the possible ocular irritation of SLS. Um, and what they did is they incubated uh, the lens, lenses from, from the eye. They took out the lens of the eye and incubated it in 20% SLS, which is an, roughly approximates the concentration of SLS in personal care products. And in order to achieve ocular irritation, they had to incubate the lenses for 14 days. Okay, so what this means in, in, lay, in a lay description is that you know, if you are planning an upcoming staycation and you were penciling into your agenda, hey, I think for the next 14 days, I am going to pour my shampoo into my eye and lay there for 14 days with, with the shampoo in my eye. Do be aware that at the end of the 14 days, you may have some ocular irritation. I mean, this is insane. I mean, it's like they didn't read the study. I'm not sure where they're getting this idea from, but you know, clearly, clearly nobody is doing that. All right. Or if you are, you know, stop doing that. All right. It's bad for you. It, it, it's going to cause eye irritation, but otherwise when we're shampooing our hair and rinsing it off, we're not doing that. Okay. So it's not, it's not realistic. It's not, it's not reality. All right. There's also a lot of fear about uh, SLS being carcinogenic or ca causing cancer. I, I, you know, I'm, I just want to interject that if you or a loved one, ha if you are suffering or have, have survived a cancer diagnosis or you have a loved one who has gone through that, I mean, this kind of stuff, it just, it, it just, it just, it, yeah, it's just wrong. <laughs> All right. I just want to take a moment to say that your suffering was not due to the fact that you, you shampooed your hair. Okay. So don't let the, the cosmetic industry tell you all this garbage that, that they're not qualified to put out there, okay? Uh, but SLS, there are no studies showing SLS to be carcinogenic whatsoever, okay? So I, I don't know where this comes from. I suspect it has to do with wrongful interpretation of SLS studies that uh, where they used SLS as a vehicle to demonstrate other things as carcinogenic. Um, and by vehicle, I mean they just resuspended the carcinogen in SLS. Um, so SLS is kind of being guilty by association here for being used in a, carcinogen, in, a, in a carcinogen study. You know, the other possible source for the carcinogenesis hype is that um, in the synthesis of sulfates, one of the byproducts is something called 1,4-dioxane. Um, and 1,4-dioxane is a, a byproduct of sulfate synthesis. It has received a lot of hype as being carcinogenic. The International Agency of Research on Cancer, I had to look down on my notes here so I don't um, misspeak, classifies 1,4-dioxane as a category 2B, meaning it is possibly carcinogenic. It is a byproduct of synthesis of many sulfates. Interestingly enough, SLS, sodium lauryl sulfate, the ingredient that gets demonized the most, actually is one of the sulfates in which 1,4-dioxane is not a byproduct, okay? It, but it is a byproduct of other, other things. However, when personal care products are being produced and generated, they are screened for 1,4-dioxane contaminant, and, and that is excluded. So it's not as though the cosmetic, it's not as though shampoos have been injecting 1,4-dioxane into, into the shampoo. It, you know, it, it is completely purified of that and is not, not a risk. And it preys on our, our fear of cancer and a diagnosis of cancer. And I think if you, ha 
Like I said, if you have ever suffered a cancer, you know, gone through a cancer diagnosis or seen a loved one, somebody close to you go through that, I mean, this really, really, really just feeds into, into a, a rational fear. I mean, cancer is, is a reality that nobody wants to go through. But, but using it to sell, to sell you a sulfate-free shampoo is just a cheap maneuver. The reality of the matter is that sulfates, particularly SLS, are actually very good detergents. They're inexpensive to make. Uh, you know, they, they impart lather to things, so you'll notice a lot of sulfate-free shampoos, they don't give that lather. They, they are very water-loving, okay? They're very hydrophilic. Their um, partition of coefficient is 1.6. That kind of is a number that uh, you know chemists can will, will understand, but it 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 um, it reflects how uh, water loving or lipid loving a a molecule or compound is. So it's very water loving, and what that means is that even if we were to absorb it somehow, it's very very unlikely to accumulate in the human body. Okay, things that are water loving don't really accumulate in the human body. Things that are are, are lipophilic are more likely to. Okay, so very very low toxicity potential just by virtue of of its chemistry. It's fully biodegradable and it's non volatile, meaning like if you leave your SLS containing shampoo there, um, it's not going to vaporize into some sort of toxic fume or anything like that, all right? It's not volatile. It is very stable, biodegradable, and is synthesized from either both synthetic as well as all natural ingredients, all right? So this is coming from things that are already present in nature. You know, a lot of vegetable oils um, are modified to produce SLS. It's not, it's not a demon thing, okay? <laughs> In terms of the evolution of shampoos and, and cleansing ingredients, sulfates, it, you know, they brought something into, into shampoo, wherein before we were relying, um, you know, on, on traditional soaps derived from animal or vegetable fats. And the problem with these is that they leave behind a, a calcium, an insoluble calcium film on the hair, on the hair shaft, on the scalp. And this makes the hair really tangled, unmanageable, just kind of like, like a nest. Has anybody ever tried to wash their hair with bar soap? It just, yeah, it doesn't go well. And that's why. It, it, it leaves behind a, a film, of, a calcium film, that you can't get off, get off with, with water. They're very, very water loving, so they're really good cleansing agents. If you are someone who uses any kind of styling products, whether it be pomades, mousses, hairsprays, a sulfate containing shampoo will help will will remove that at the end of the day which is important that stuff is sticky it leaves a film on your hair on your scalp on your hair shaft that sticky film gloms onto aerosolized allergens dirt molecules traps sebum and oil at the scalp um, it, it, it makes your your hair dirty okay and sulfate containing shampoos effectively remove that they're very water soluble do a very good job of taking that taking that off, all right? Their downside is that because they are removing dirt and oil so efficiently, they can remove some of your you know, natural oils, some of the, the natural skin barrier oils, and make your scalp a little bit drier, your hair shaft a little bit drier, all right? So many people find that alternating a, a more conditioning shampoo that has a ratio of, of detergents in it, that is formulated with a ratio of detergents in it that um, kind of conditions the hair shaft rather than cleanses. They find that alternating with that as well as a as a as well as a shampoo that uh, contains more SLS can kind of kind of balance that out a little bit where you're getting the cleansing, you're you're remo removing all that bulk up, but then you're also conditioning the hair shaft to kind of to kind of bounce back <laughs> from that. So, you know, there's really no evidence that SLS is harmful to human health, that it's carcinogenic, that it's gonna cause ocular irritation. There's really no reason, rational reason to avoid it or to exclude it from personal care products. And it really, really just bothers me when, when cosmetic companies, they come up with these lists of like ingredients that they've chosen to, to demonize and that are bad and their products are going to, to meet this clean list of clean ingredients. It makes zero sense. And the people touting these claims have zero qualifications for, for making these claims, all right? 
being a expert in the beauty industry does not equate to being able to interpret a scientific study. Uh, it does not equate to a PhD in, in chemistry. It doesn't equate to, to any of this. I mean, it doesn't make you qualified to interpret these things. What it makes you qualified to do, you know, being having, having industry experience, really what that's code for is you you're qualified to to create a product and sell it okay so don't be misled by these by these credentials of beauty beauty expert uh industry expert 20 years of experience in the beauty industry that does not that does not equate to to being able to interpret science <laughs> the phobia around this ingredient and around other ingredients like parabens it's 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 reached this contagion and people I hear all of the time people just spit it out well you know I oh that's got sulfates in it I know it's bad I know it's bad really <laughs> it's not okay there's nothing to show that it's bad all right the only people telling you it's bad are those people trying to sell you a product that does not contain sulfates in it all right uh, that's their angle products that are free of of whatever ingredient they've chosen to to remove that doesn't mean that the product a offers you anything or b doesn't contain other things that can cause problems Cleansing the scalp and shampooing the hair shafts is actually an important part of skincare. Understandably, not all hair types are going to tolerate frequent shampooing. So that you, you will have a sense of based on, on your hair type. Um, but shampooing is not something to, to avoid. There's this whole no, no shampoo thing that people were all about. I haven't heard it, it being hyped up as much as of late, but um, you know, cleansing the scalp and removing dirt and oil is, is an important part of skincare. We have a very high density of sebaceous oil glands in our scalp. And, and we also have a little yeast that lives on our skin called malassezia. And when things get too oily and, 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 and whatnot, the, that little yeast starts to proliferate. And that proliferation of that yeast and that excess yeast growth, um, it's not dangerous, but it contributes to things like dandruff, seborrhea, um, and flakiness of the scalp. And cleansing is a really important part of, of keeping the skin of the scalp healthy. And so you shouldn't fear shampoos or detergents. You shouldn't fear stripping your natural oils off of your scalp. Um, there's, there's plenty of oil production up there. You're not going to strip the oils off of your scalp or your hair shaft. Yes, a little bit will come off as part of shampooing. You can use things like conditioners to combat that, but you know, there's no, it doesn't make sense to avoid cleansing. Aero allergens, pollens, and things like that are trapped on the hair shaft as well. Uh, these can, you know, you wear your, you have long hair, you wear your hair down. This can kind of drive seasonal allergies because you're constantly having that that aero allergen dancing around your face. Um, it can lead to irritation on the skin. So very important to to cleanse the the scalp and the hair shaft with at least some frequency guided based on your hair type as far as as how how well your hair can can withstand it. Personally, I have, you know, the, the type of hair where I, I shampoo my hair every day and, you know, I have, I, I have never had any problems with that. But I'm keenly aware of the fact that, you know, certain hair types, types of hair cannot tolerate that. In my mind, there is no reason to avoid sulfates. There's no data to suggest that sulfates like sodium lauryl sulfate are dangerous to your health. Um, I hope this video is helpful to you guys. Um, if you liked it, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and as always, don't forget, sunscreen is